And now, uh, please, let's have open our ears and minds and hearts as our brother Greg teaches us from God's holy word. There we go. Hello, test. All right. Well, geez, this is nerve wracking. <laughs> um, so if you will mind, uh, let's open up in prayer and we'll bring some of these nerves to the Lord and we'll ask him to, to teach us from his word. Um, Father, we thank you and we praise you uh, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for another day here on earth with you. And we, um, we just thank you, Lord, that you are the almighty, the all-powerful, and that you go before us, beside us, and you've got our backs. And we just pray, Lord, that, um, that as we delve into your word, um, that we would hear from you, that you would soften our hearts to receive it, um, and, and seek to grow in you, that we might be better tools for your, for your service, Lord. Uh, we humble ourselves before you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, so, uh, Public Speaking 101 uh, says, if the speaker is nervous and to loosen up the crowd, you start with a joke. So, I got a good one. Uh, did you know that Jesus is divine, right? And that we are the branches, right? Yeah, all right. See, it works. All right. Let's go. Uh, so, in thinking about what I wanted to talk about, um, what I wanted to teach on, my mind went in several different directions. Um, I was initially given to fear, as the flesh does, um, because who doesn't hate public speaking? Especially when talking on God's holy word. That's not, it's not something you want to mess up. Um, in contrast, I was also excited uh, because if spirit animals were real, mine, like Pastor Bill would probably admit his to be, would be a donkey, uh, Balaam's donkey. So if anything intelligible comes from my mouth tonight, we know who to thank. Um, but when praying about what the Lord would want me to teach and uh, what he would work on in me first to hand to you, uh, my spirit couldn't help but be fixed on children, um, especially with Roe v. Wade and whatnot having gone on. Praise God for that. Um, many of you already know that my wife and I are fairly new parents to Anthony, our one-and-a-half-year-old son. God's word teaches in Psalm 127 that children are a blessing from the Lord and that they are a reward from him. I didn't know how true that that, that verse would be until I finally held and saw Anthony for the first time, uh, which all the more baffles me to hear about how the world sees and cheats children today. Praise God for Roe v. Wade and that it was overturned. It's a good step in the right direction. But it sickens me to see the result, the resulting outrage and blatant statements of a desire to kill their babies just because they want to out of convenience. How in the world did we go from a gift from the Lord to a cancer to be rid of? So we will be discussing Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 tonight. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Uh, when we get to verse 4, we'll be focusing more so on that one um, and in, in what fathers play a role in, the, in our children's lives. Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4. We start in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Now, whenever I read verses 2 and 3, I always come, which come from the, uh, the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5, I always think of uh, when I was younger and I would be mischievous, and uh, my mom would jokingly, I'm pretty sure, say, I brought you into this world and I can take you out, so honor me. <laughs> but, so, honor your father and mother. Uh, in these four verses in Ephesians, we see the, the members, mother, father, and son, or children. Uh, we see the hierarchy and the roles that each person plays within a family as God has intended it to be. The children are to be subject to the parents, the mother and father are to be over the children, and the father is to teach and admonish as the Lord has commanded. 
Those in the world right now, sadly, have many different roles for these three individual persons. Some might not even be able to define them at all because they're not biologists. Men show toxic masculinity for being strong, courageous, and compassionate leaders of their homes. Women that submit to their husbands as unto the Lord is the result of sexism and oppression. And children are not a gift from the Lord, in fact, but are no more than a clump of cells to be conveniently discarded and swept under the rug and to be forgotten. And on that, on that last note there, um, the Lord showed me a couple months or a month or so back um, when Roe v. Wade was ramping up the overturning. Um, it was a breath of fresh air, uh, and I want to share it. It's in Isaiah 49, verses 14 and 15. Uh, it says, But Zion, Jerusalem, says, The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion of, on the son of her womb? Now, that first part of verse 15 there, my mind immediately went, no. How is that possible? How can a woman forget her nursing child or have no compassion or love for the son of her womb? But God knew what our world would need. God knew what humans were capable of, what evil we could do. And so 15 continues, surely they may forget, but I will not forget. And that was, that was massively reassuring to me. Uh, all these 60 million plus that the Lord will never forget. So back on our verses, in this extreme perversion of the truth and lack of knowledge that we're experiencing today, we are called by James in his book to ask God for his wisdom, who is generous to give it out. How does God define a father and mother? And as a result, what does that mean for our children? I haven't been a father for long, just about a year and a half, plus nine months of pregnancy, life of conception. So I only have a little experience in parenting, but I do have full confidence in God and his word. And so when he says that children are a blessing and happy is the man who has a quiver full of them, even with just the one little guy so far, I can hold on to these truths to filter out the lies of the world. And what better place to learn to be a father than from our good father? Verse 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. This is a direct commandment from the Lord to fathers. And in contrast, they are to be the ones to bring the children up in the ways of the Lord. Them specifically. In the Greek, the word to bring up is ektrepho, which means to nurture, to nourish, and to nourish to maturity. This is the same word that is used in Ephesians 5, 28 and 29, speaking about husbands and their duties and obligations to their wives. So just one chapter back or the same page if you're there, Ephesians 5, 28. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes. That's that word, ektrepho, nourishes. And as the, as the Lord does the church. Because of the spiritual communion and bond that the Lord has fashioned between a man and his wife, we see this physical representation on how a man is to love and support his wife, just as much as he cares about protecting and nourishing his own flesh. Pastor Bill has often used the example of when we look at ourselves in the mirror, we don't make fun of the way we look. We don't say, I'm glad you're fat or I'm glad you're ugly. Don't you think that barn needs a little more painting? We see the things that we don't like and we wish better for ourselves. We love our flesh. This duty to love our wives as our own flesh is expounded on by Paul, again, to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 7, 4. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And the wife, likewise, does not, or the, and likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. If this is the ownership and obligation and commandment by, the God, by God that we have to our wives, that, is, that established us uh, together in our spiritual communion, how much more are children whom we share a physical bloodline connection with? When Adam woke up from his deep sleep, one rib lighter, he says in Genesis 2, verse 23, at last this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. 
our children as well are bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh, quite literally. And we are to nourish them as such and not to provoke them to wrath. If we provoke them to wrath, we aren't loving them as our own flesh. We make them our enemy. Conflict, animosity, and bitterness will be the result and consequently causing our children to bolt from our homes when they get the chance to and ultimately destroying the relationship that the parents desire to have with them. John MacArthur, in his teaching on this section of, of scripture, he listed several ways that this might be done to anger our children. A few of the key ways, one of them is overprotection. Fencing them in, denying them the opportunity to develop independence, never allowing them to make mistakes and learning from them. Kayla, my wife, has been a very good mother to Anthony. I am very blessed. And she didn't pay me to say that. She just told me to. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, but a small example, and kudos to her, is this. When, when feeding our son, Anthony, uh, it can be a pretty messy ordeal, especially when left to his own devices. And so when I'm feeding him in my male, what can I do to fix the problem brain, I try to be as tidy as I possibly can, scooping the leftovers from the corners of his mouth with each bite, and feeding him finger foods from my own hand, because the less he touches, the better. Uh, so thinking I was being loving uh, by keeping him clean. One morning, I came home from work, uh, and I saw Kayla, my sweet wife, place an entire bowl of yogurt and a spoon in front of him, uh, open and within reach. We're normally trying to keep everything out of reach from him, but it was right there. And my mind immediately went to envisioning the mess that he'd be in in about 2.2 seconds. Of course, I told her and informed her of the impending mess as if she didn't already know the risk. And I informed her that he doesn't even know how to use a spoon properly. Nevertheless, out of wanting to give him a chance, we, we demonstrated, we directed, and we encouraged him, despite every other spoonful landing on the table, on his lap, or on the floor. I'd be lying if I said I didn't have an I told you so thought every, well, every now and again. But through perseverance and a lot of patience on our end, uh, he's now gotten to the point where he can confidently leave the bowl in front of him and use the spoon. And how often has the Lord left us in our free will to our own devices, out of love, to allow us to learn and grow? I definitely have experienced this. The biggest lesson in my life that I've learned from so far was during my rebellious times when I was younger. I was brought up in the church and brought up in a Christian household. I knew I didn't know anything else. But it wasn't until I walked away from the Lord for a time that I realized what I once had and the abundant life that I was missing out on. Our God a lot lovingly allows us to fall on our faces. Another example of how we can in provoke our kids to wrath is pushing unrealistic achievements upon them. Parents, whether in, in academics or athletics or social successes, parents can literally crush their children under the immense pressure to excel. The term uh, as it's commonly referred to as tiger parenting, is defined as a form of strict parenting which parents push their children to standards of high success. Oftentimes, these parents believe that continuous criticism and focuses on the children's shortcomings will motivate their children to fix their flaws. This parenting style is particularly popular but not limited to the Asian and Asian American communities, and so the CDC an acronym I don't appreciate to hear much from nowadays, but back in 2018, they ran a study showing the leading causes of death among Asian Americans. The number one leading cause among 15 to 19 year olds being, by a large margin from second place, was suicide. The strong desire to please their parents, who they love and respect and want to receive their approval from, it was not strong enough to overpower the monstrous expectations of success placed upon them. And like me, thinking that I was helping and loving Anthony by not allowing him to feed himself and keeping him clean, these parents imposed these unattainable goals upon their children out of supposed love and wanting the best for their children. 
under the law of Moses, we're taught that it is impossible to attain perfect favor with our perfect God. We can't meet his expectations. Our flaws are numerous and our failings are daily. However, it's not God who condemns us with these shortcomings as a tiger parent might, but it is the enemy who seeks to only ki steal, kill, and destroy. Those are his weapons of warfare. But God, those two most beautiful words that have ever been spoken together, we fail, we fall short of his glory, but God. So let's turn to Ephesians 2 with me, if you will, and we'll see one of these but God examples. Ephesians 2, verse 1. And he made, and you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the, pow the spirit of who now works in you, the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all under we, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Man, if this isn't a falling short of God's glory and a perfect description of how I once was, I don't know what is. But then we get to the good part in verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised, up, raised us up together and made us to sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Where we lack, God moves. We cannot attain his perfect expectations. Where we lack, God moves. We are to meet our children where they are at, to build them up and encourage them even in their incompetencies. Next example of how we might provoke our children to wrath is failing to sacrifice for them. Failing to sacrifice for them. To sacrifice our own time, our own plans, our own desires for them. If we fail to sacrifice for our children, they will come to think that they are nothing more than an intrusion on our lives. If they, bring us up, if, if they bring up something that they want to buy and it gets in the way of what we want to buy, or if they bring up somewhere they want to go and it gets in the way of our plans or where we want to go, and we refuse to sacrifice for them, eventually they will lose the desire to have individual thought and feel as though they are just along for the ride to be seen and not heard. That's what I've often heard my dad ex explain how he was supposed to be seen and not heard. However, if I see something that I need, but instead deny myself and get something for him that he needs, that sends the message to him that he's not an intrusion and a burden, but he is in fact important and even more important than I am. Philippians 2, 1 through 4 says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection of mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look, let each of you look not only to his own self-interest, but also to the interests of others. Again, looking to our God for, as our example of a good father. God, the Father, sent his Son to be crucified for us. Jesus took on the form of a man and gave up his position at the right hand of the Father for us. Jesus Christ called, or cried out for the cup to pass from him, but instead desired the will of the Father rather than his own will. For us. 
As the father of the home, it is easy to think of the things that I want or the house needs or the family needs. And it's easy to neglect the desires of the children. We need to make time for them. Our last or next example of how we might provoke our children to wrath is neglecting them. We should never ignore our children, push them away or avoid them or deny our children of ourselves or our affection and love for them as a form of punishment. Giving them the silent treatment will only build up anger within them. Numerous times the Lord tells us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. In times when we feel like he is distant, his eyes are still upon us. Even in times of walking away from him, he is the father of the prodigal son, eagerly waiting for us to return. We are to always be available for our children. So these are some of the negatives, the, the things to not do to our children. So we'll look at some of the positives, things to do. Back in verse 4 of Ephesians 6, it says to bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Through the work of Christ, we are the children of God as well, grafted into the family with his chosen people. We see numerous times in the Old Testament of God, or in the Old Testament of God's love for his chosen people, his children. If we are to bring up our children in the training and admonition of the Lord, what better way to learn than how the Father, the Lord fathers, his, fathers and instructs his children. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 6, verse 1. And we'll see God's instructions for his people and how he brings them up. Deuteronomy 6, 1. And this comes after Deuteronomy 5, of course, as uh, where Moses was just handed the Ten Commandments from God. And so we'll see what God tells his people to do with these Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy 6, 1. Verse 1. These are the commands, the decrees, and laws of the Lord, your God, directed to me to teach to you in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and the, their children... After them may fear the Lord, your God, as long as you live and by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, so that you may enjoy long life, very similar to our, our scripture in, in Ephesians, long life. Hear Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may, in, may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, your God, the God of your ancestors promised you. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk to them when, they, when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. First we see we are to recognize God as supreme. The Lord is one. We are to teach our children that. We are to teach them to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and strength. God's commandments, God's word should be a part of every moment of our day. Each day of our lives is to be a classroom in God's word. We are to memorize them and to hide them in our hearts. Teach them to our children. Talk about God's word to them when we are sitting around the house. When something comes on the TV that is not okay, it's not, it's not enough to just flip the channel or to turn it off. We need to explain to our children what his word says about what just came up. When walking down the street, you're almost guaranteed to see several things that the Lord is not okay with, from risque billboards to crude words and jokes spoken by people, to the pot shop on the corner, to the skimpy clothes within Walmart that we're not going to buy and why we're not buying them. But also giving glory to God for the birds, the trees, the mountains, the air, the beauty of it all. There is never an excuse to have nothing to say about the Lord. His glory is all around us. 
And to tie them on our hands and write them on our foreheads symbolizes that the work of our hands and the thoughts of our mind are to be on the Lord continually. We are to lead by example. Monkey see, monkey do. I love seeing the mannerisms and the, the ways that Anthony copies Kayla and I. It's a blessing to me. So we, uh, we listen to Christian music and Sunday school songs in our house quite often. And Anthony has learned from seeing Kayla and I uh, to raise our hands in praise to the Lord. And it's beautiful to me. I can, I can only imagine what it, the smile on the face of the Lord looks when he sees that. But lately we've been having to correct him in this. We went out recently to a restaurant a few weeks back that was playing music overhead. And he's there sitting in his high chair, rocking back and forth, raising his hands to some journey or whatever it was. <laughs> Bless his heart. But... But it was a beautiful picture nonetheless, a picture of the childlike faith that we are called to have, the childlike innocence to lift holy hands and praise the Lord even when in, the surround, in and surrounded by the world, not caring who sees except our Father in heaven. God has a heart for children like none other. He knows them before they exist. He knits them in their mother's womb. His mercy is extended to children until they can come up to comprehend and know personally the love of God. Jesus also uses children as, an, as a teaching point to his disciples and followers a few different times. Luke 18, verse 15 says, Then they also brought infants to him that they might touch him, or might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him and said, Let the little children come to me. And do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. That's huge. And in Matthew 18, verse 1, at that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Is it me? Then Jesus said to the said. Or Jesus called a little child to them, to him, and, and set them in their midst, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one of these little children like this is, in my name, receives me. Jesus uses the simple things, a child in this example, to confound the wise, a Balaam's donkey scenario, if you will. What adult would think to himself when looking at a child, what can I learn from him or her? 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 20 through 29 says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, and not many noble are called. But God chooses the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh may glory in his presence. Um, another one of Anthony's stories that I was excited to share, uh, because it was a, it, the Lord used it to humble me, and I felt, I felt smaller than he did, than, than him at a two-month-old at that time. So when he was about two months old, um, the, the logistical exchange of uh, the two-way loving relationship that I had with him at the point uh, was very one-sided. I provided love to him, and he provided uh, eat, sleep, poop, repeat to me, and that's, that's what our exchange at that age was. And much like our relationship with the Lord, all we have to provide to him are filthy rags. That's what our works bring to him. But from a logistical standpoint, him laying on the changing table for me, what, what reason do I have to, to, to love him, to help him, to cherish him? What has he done for me? Of course I love him and cherish him unconditionally. He doesn't have to do anything for me. And so 
him laying on the changing table, laying in his poopy diaper. I love him, and I don't want him to e exist in that poop. If I leave him there long enough, it's going to burn his bottom, and he's going he's to suffer from it. So for my good namesake, because he is my namesake, I want him out of that, and so I will sacrifice my cleanliness to, to get him out of that dirty diaper and to place a new one on him, knowing full well that we're going to meet each other on these same terms again in a couple hours. We're going to have another dirty diaper, and I'm going to give him a new one. Having that foreknowledge, I still love and cherish him and want him to be clean and to get up and walk and continue in his life. Um, I think I went through, oh, look at that. We're actually good on time. I was thinking I was going too quick. <laughs> um, children are precious. Children are to be loved and protected by their mothers and fathers. If these two strong, firm pillars of the home are allowed to be defined and dismantled as the world has been working so hard to do, then our children are unguarded and ripe for the enemy's picking. We need to stand to lead and to love our children as God would have them to so that they will be brought up and raise their own children in the ways of the Lord as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, we praise you that you are in our midst, that your word speaks truth. And we thank you for that, that we know truth in you. We don't have to be wandering in this world and wandering in darkness. We pray, Lord, that your words tonight would rest in our hearts, take seed and, and grow, and that we might not just know them, but, Lord, do them. We, li we lift up the rest of this night to you, our fellowship afterwards, and, and, our, and our lives outside these doors, that we would do your work. In your holy name that we pray, amen.